Today, we're going to talk about estate planning 101, the very basics, estate taxes. And uh, I just, you know, since Shana did mention Medicaid, just a couple of very quick, you know, quick items. Uh, I know Shana mentioned she may have another session, but hot off the presses, the uh, 2023 budget was signed by the governor and Medicaid levels for 2023 are going to increase quite a bit, going from around 16,800 to over 28,000. And don't forget, there are ways to protect your assets if you have more assets than, than that. That's what we do all the time. And the income level is going up quite a bit as well. Uh, so that's something you should know. And the Medicaid look back, that 30 month or two and a half year look back is likely going to start uh, July 1, but we don't have a definitive answer yet. So uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, okay, so this is going to be on estate planning. Every time I, I speak, I like to just remind everyone, you have to get your team together. It's not just me, the attorney. You need a good financial advisor if you have assets, a good CPA. If you need assistance, maybe there's a geriatric care manager involved, uh, et cetera. So you do want to coordinate a team. And when you need something, you're going to have everything in place. That's really very, very crucial. Now, I want to start off with estate taxes because that's part of the title today. But I want to let you know that probably 99% of you don't have enough assets to be charged with an estate tax. So let's go over this first. I do want to get it out of the way. Everybody's so worried about estate taxes, but under the current system, most people don't have enough to qualify. Uh, and, you know, I guess that's a good thing, or I guess really it's a bad thing. You would want to have a lot of assets and you would want to pay some estate taxes down the road. But estate taxes are, could be a very high percentage of what you have, but you have to be over the threshold. So the federal government, not New York State, we're going to get to New York State in a minute. The federal government has an exemption. So if you have assets under, yes, this is the figure, $12,060,000, then if you die over the next couple of years, there's no estate tax on a federal level. However, at the end of 2025, right before 2026 starts at midnight, uh, that level is scheduled to be had. So the 12 million or so will come down to 6 million plus inflation. But still, not many people have $6 million. But if you do have assets over that level, the federal estate tax rate is huge. It's 40%. The gift tax rate is 40%. And when, when you add the federal with the, the state, New York state gift tax, and uh, sorry, New York state estate tax, many clients are looking at half of their estate being taxed, but you have to have those very high assets. Now, you may ask, well, what is in your estate? Well, it's the obvious your bank accounts, your brokerage accounts, your home, your, and a lot of people don't realize this, your retirement accounts. Yes, even though you haven't paid income taxes on it yet, it's part of your estate. What about life insurance? It's part of your estate. What about term life insurance with no cash value? Believe it or not, if you, just paying a few hundred bucks a year, you're young enough, and you have a few million dollar term policy, and you die and you own that policy, it's part of your taxable estate. So you have to be aware uh, that 
All of this comprises of your taxable estate for federal and New York state estate taxes. Now the federal level, that 12,060,000 is an exemption for federal gift and estate taxes. So look at the last bullet point. You, I, anyone can give any other person $16,000 a year gift tax free. You're not gonna be taxed on that gift. Husband and wife could give double that, $32,000 a year, a calendar year, and you won't be taxed. Let's say you have 10 children with 10 spouses. You can give them, each one of them, $16,000, or husband and wife, $32,000 to each of the 10 children, and to each of the 10 spouses and to the grandchildren and maybe their spouses and to friends that you like and attorneys that you like, I'm being facetious, but you could give gifts to any individual and it is uh, gift tax free. So the federal government raised it from the 10,000 level. This year it went up to 16,000, 32,000, husband and wife can make a gift. You don't have to pay any uh, gift taxes. You don't have to file a gift tax return. It's a total free transfer. Okay, and that's good, uh, that's good. But the federal exemption is a gift slash estate tax exemption. And if you make a gift over the 16,000, well then you start to use up that $12 million exemption. So let's say, this is how high this number is, it's crazy. But let's say you want a gift, uh, pick a big number and it's huge. I don't know anybody wants to do this, but if you want to gift $500,000, if you even have $500,000, let's say $516,000 to your son. The first 16,000 is gift tax free under the annual exclusion. The next 500,000, you don't pay taxes on. You just reduce the $12,060,000 exclusion. So most people don't have anywhere near the uh, assets. Uh, to have to pay gift taxes or estate taxes, but maybe you do fall within that. And if you do, and let's say you start to make gifts or part of a Medicaid plan and you, you're gifting a home valued at, let's say 700,000 or 16,000 is gift tax free, the balance, you don't pay taxes on it. You know, when we do our Medicaid planning and we transfer, to, to a trust or possibly to a child, you know, we determine if we have to uh, file a gift tax return. But even if you do, you're just reducing that very high level, that 12060000 You don't pay any taxes until that full exemption is, you use it all up. And most of you, most of anyone that we uh, deal with, don't have those kind of assets. Some do, most don't. Okay, so that's the federal. New York State has an exemption and exclusion of about half. It's 6.11 million. But you have to be very careful. If you go over, if your assets are over that 6.11 million by a little bit, by 5%, you fall off the cliff and you have to pay estate taxes from dollar one. So there's planning that we can do. And the planning that we can do is fairly straightforward because yes, the federal government has an estate tax, but there's this huge $12 million exclusion. New York state's level is half, but New York state does not have an estate, uh, a gift tax. They only have an estate tax. So New York State, no gift tax. 
federal has a gift tax and an estate tax. New York State just has the estate tax. But they say, we're not going to tax your gifts, but if you make a gift within three years of the time you die, we're going to say that gift was made in contemplation of death even if it wasn't, it's just a rule. They're gonna claw back any gifts made within three years of death, and they're gonna tax it as an estate tax. Whereas the federal gift and estate tax rate is 40%, New York State's rates range from about three to 16%. So I'd venture to say, that maybe all of you, or maybe most of you, don't have to worry about estate taxes. But it's very important to know this because everybody's worried about it. When we do our Medicaid planning and we're transferring into trust and they say, oh, I can only give 16,000 or 32,000. That's not true. You could gift another 12 million if you had it and there's no gift tax. So we could do all the Medicaid planning in the world that we wanna do, and there's no problem. And if you are lucky enough to have assets over the 6 million for New York State, I know it's 12 million for the federal government, but that's where we really have to start to talk about estate and gift planning. You should also know that, uh, again, uh, and I've mentioned this, Starting in uh, uh, January 1, 2026, that 12 million is going to be half. It's going to be about 6 million. So any planning that we do right now, we're looking at that $6 million figure. But the federal government, as they have done quite a bit, they're giving wealthy people a gift. What they're saying is that if you use, if you gift out, a lot of money, and I just spoke to a very wealthy client before I got on this uh, webinar. If you're gonna be gifting out 12 million, I'm sorry, $6 million out of the 12 million, when we have that level on January 1, 2026, then you'll still have 6 million. But if you don't use it, you lose it. So, Wealthier clients, like the conversation I had today was, I don't want to lose that. It's like throwing away how much? About $3 million. How is that possible? Well, if I could say, if I could protect $6 million of an exclusion that's going away in a couple of years and transfer assets into a trust, I'll use it. I won't lose it. So my family could get everything, uh, the 6 million uh, gift and estate tax free and another 6 million estate tax free. Why not? So there's a lot of planning that could be done for wealthier individuals, but we do a lot, a lot of Medicaid planning, planning for long-term care, making sure you could pay for your healthcare needs going forward including home care and nursing home care, et cetera. And almost everyone that we do this planning for, they don't have these sorts of assets. Most people don't, shouldn't feel bad about it. Most people don't. So when we talk about estate planning, it's not just about estate taxes. It's about everything. Estate planning means that you should have your documents in place. That's your last will and testament your power of attorney. We don't have a statutory gifts rider any longer, a healthcare proxy, a living will, and especially a living trust. Living trusts are probably the best way to protect assets for our clients, for long-term care, sometimes for estate tax purposes, but just to effectuate a smooth transfer of assets without probate, without anyone contesting your will, uh, making sure that if God forbid you become incapacitated, you have your trust in place and everything is smooth. Uh, and there's so, you know, you, you, 
the, the taxes that you say, maybe not estate taxes, but that as well, but what about capital gains taxes? You know, let's say you bought a home for 50,000 and now it's worth 600,000, huge capital gains. Well, we wanna protect that gain. And we do that with a trust. We do the Medicaid planning and the trust. We also do estate planning. But again, most people don't have that level of assets. So you wanna have a will, you want to have a special planning power of attorney, excuse me, a healthcare proxy, a living will, and your living trust, whether that trust is revocable or irrevocable. Now, I put this last bullet point here for a reason. And, uh, you know, so many times when I speak to a client, uh, they may feel like they want a child there with them to help them make decision regarding their documents. Well, that's okay, but it's not all that okay because many times the child might try to influence you. You know, I just want to make sure then that when we draft documents for our clients, I want to make sure that these documents are yours, they're not anyone else's. And I want to make sure that you are not influenced by any family dynamics, by any children, or anyone else. You should do what you want to do. And it was so interesting in the meeting that I had prior to this webinar with uh, pretty wealthy clients, uh, the mom came on with her son and uh, the, the son was very forceful about, you know, how he wanted to see things uh, done. And, uh, you know, it was just very interesting with the dynamics. He loved his mom. He was being very fair, but forceful. And, uh, you know, you just want to make sure that you're just not influenced by anyone else. So everyone should have a will. You know, everyone should have a will. There's just no question. And a will will dictate where your assets go when you pass away, not all of your assets, because if you have assets in a trust, well, that'll go pursuant to the terms in the trust. And that trust might also protect assets against creditors, Medicaid, you know, all sorts of things. <clears throat> and trusts, again, are typically the best way to do things. Uh, beneficiaries can be individuals, family, could be friends. It could be another trust in the will. You know, you might want to, in, in your will, you might want to say, I give my assets to my three children equally, to child A outright, to child B outright, but child C maybe not outright. Maybe child C is a, a minor and uh, maybe it'll go into a minor's trust or child C is disabled and we do a special trust for an individual with a disability called the special needs trust. We'll get into that. Um, but. There are many different ways to set up a will. That will's got to be yours. The parties to a will would be the individual that signs it, the creator. That's called the testator. Look at the third bullet point. The named executor obviously can't be you because it's your will. Uh, but after death, it could be a child. Any individual is over 18. And beneficiaries could be any individual could even be a trust, uh, a trust for a pet. We do a lot of pet trusts. Remember Leona Helmsley, Helmsley gave, I think it was $12 million to her dog. Uh, you know, it's crazy, but you can do that. You could give to charities, et cetera, or it could be a continuing trust. You know, when people say you can't control from the grave, well, from my point of view, you can. Because in your will, in your trust, you could continue to have those assets held in a trust just the way you want them to be. And they could be distributed just the way you want them to be. There are many different ways to avoid a will contest. We have many techniques if that's an issue. But again, you want to tailor your will to your individual needs, your individual wants. Etc. Now look at that last bullet point. 
is there anyone, is there anyone that you have to provide for in your will? The answer is no. Do you have to provide for a spouse? No. Do you have to provide for a child? Not really. You know, you have to provide for relatives. Uh uh. However, if a spouse doesn't get the greater of uh, $50,000, the greater of $50,000 or one third of your estate, that spouse that was left out has a right. It's called the right of election. They don't have to prove that they need the money, want the money, they don't have to prove anything. They just have to prove that they were married to the individual at the time of death. And uh, that's called the spouse's right of election. That can be waived for estate purposes with a prenup, a postnup, a waiver of the right of election document. So that could be waived with no problem. However, Medicaid doesn't recognize the waiver. The federal government for estate purposes does, and New York State does also, not for Medicaid, for all other estate planning needs. Yes, it's recognized. You would want not only just a will, but and not just a plain power of attorney, but an expanded power of attorney. Because let's face it, uh, planning may need to be done beyond those provisions in a form. So we might add an extra 30, 40 extra and just needed, needed provisions into that power of attorney, such as the right to modify a trust, to revoke a trust, to create a trust, to protect assets, to do Medicaid planning, to do estate planning, to disclaim assets, to make gifts for Medicaid purposes, for estate tax purposes. Uh, the, the list just goes on and on. And in that power of attorney, we put in provisions for estate planning, for Medicaid, an intent to return home, to protect your home so it's all there. The list, again, goes on and on, but you don't want to use a form. You want it to be an expanded planning power of attorney. If you're just going to a closing and you want someone else to sign the docs, you could have a simple power. But if you want to make sure that, that your estate will be protected, you'll be able to get on Medicaid, God forbid, if you become incapacitated, you need, it's not a maybe, you need the expanded planning power of attorney. Now we have a new power of attorney as of June 13th. Reforms were needed. The power of attorney was complicated. Signing requirements were different for a gift writer, for the power of attorney. It was unwieldy. And the biggest part was banks simply didn't want to accept the power even though the law said they had to. So with this new law, there's teeth built into the power of attorney law to make sure that the banks and the brokerage houses and third parties would accept that power of attorney. So what are the major changes? There's no more statutory gifts rider. The law now says uh, if the wording, if the statutory language in that power of attorney is a little bit off, it's okay, as long as you substantially conform with the language. Don't forget, we gotta add all of those extra provisions if you wanna be protected. Uh, but this is good. Signing requirements changed, but now we're in conformity with other states. And we have the T. If a bank or brokerage house or a third party doesn't accept the power and they're being unreasonable, we could sue them, but damages, attorney's fees, they could lose their shirt. So now the banks and brokerage houses are being very accommodating because they know that they're going to get sued if they don't play nice in the sandbox. Okay, no more statutory gifts rider, but what does that mean? 
all of the extra provisions that we put in that statutory gifts rider now has to go into the basic modification section of that power. So those 30, 40 provisions we got to bring in along with the provisions that we had in the power itself. So we need, you know, it's a, it's, it's a bit clumsy, but we don't have that separate rider to the document. So just be aware. It doesn't mean that, uh, you know, because it, there's no separate form for a statutory gifts rider, doesn't mean that we don't need all of those extra forms that we had to manually put in to protect you. We just have to put that in the main body of the power. Look at the last uh, uh, note, the last bullet point. If you name two agents to act together, but you don't specify if they're gonna act separately or together, they must act together if they're both living. What are the signing requirements? Well, you need two witnesses and a notary. However, one of the witnesses could be a notary. So you really need two individuals if one of them are a notary. Now, why do I like this? Well, number one, it conforms to what the law is in many states. Look at Florida. Uh, now, since June 13th of last year, uh, all of the powers that we had signed in New York well, Florida would recognize it. Why? Because we have two witnesses and a notary. So that part is good. The acceptance and reliable is crucial. And you guys should really know about this. So let me go through it. Uh, let's say you present the power of attorney to a bank and a power of attorney uh, uh, is, re is rejected by the bank. So they have 10 days to reject it in writing, okay? And that writing has to go to the principal, let's say if it's your power, you, and to the agent. So they have 10 days to reject it. Now, if we feel that they're being unreasonable, we then have to write back to the bank and say, you're being unreasonable. By law, you have to accept it. The principal is still living. The power was signed properly. It's a statutory power uh, of attorney in New York State. We have all of these extra provisions in there to protect our client. And you have to recognize it. We go through why it has to be recognized. The financial institution or the bank then has seven days to either accept it or reject it. But if they then reject it, and there are damages, we are gonna get them. I can't wait to roll up my sleeves and get one of these cases. That would be, in my mind, very cool. I would love that because I don't wanna see my clients have problems. And when there's a case and the bank sees or the brokerage house sees the damages that they could have plus attorney's fees, maybe again, they'll work with us as they should. They'll play nice in the sandbox which is what we want them to do. Okay, and again, the planning power is not something you should do. Don't download it. It's a, it, it's a complicated document, more complicated than a will. I'd say much more complicated than a will. So, you know, sometimes you only get one shot. Uh, you just need to get it uh, done the right way. Uh, so that's something that's absolutely uh, crucial because if you become incapacitated and you don't have the right kind of power of attorney, game over. We have to go to court and we're subject to whatever the court wants. We're subject to the court and you don't want that. You want things to go smoothly, easily, easily uh, done, less complicated and much, much, much less expensive uh, uh, you know, if a court is not involved. So that's something that's really important. Healthcare proxy, the will, you should have uh, our firm or another uh, good uh, firm do the will. Same thing with the power of attorney for planning purposes. Healthcare proxy, that's a fairly simple document. You could do that on your own, but a healthcare proxy is where you appoint someone else to make healthcare decisions for you. And it's only when you uh, can't make your own decisions. 
for the healthcare proxy, you don't need a notary, just two witnesses. Uh, and uh, the witnesses should not be anyone that you named as a healthcare agent or proxy. Don't need a notary, it's quite simple. You could do that one on your own, not the will, not the power of attorney for planning, certainly not the living trust. Okay, so what is a trust? You know, when we talk about estate planning, a trust is really the basis of almost all estate planning. So what is a trust? A trust is an entity. An entity, think of it like a corporation. Trust is an, but it's not a corporation. It's an entity that's created with an agreement. That agreement is called a trust agreement. So there's a trust agreement that is signed by the parties to the trust. That agreement creates this entity. This entity holds assets and those assets are managed in accordance with the terms of the trust. So a living trust is a trust that's signed while you're living and it's good right now. Sign now, it comes into effect now. The moment you sign it, the trust is good. What about a testamentary trust? That's a trust within the will. So when you sign, you know, sign your will and we have the witnesses, et cetera, and the will is fine, and you put one of the beneficiaries or all of them, the beneficiaries to be a trust that we have in the will. Is that trust valid right now? No, the will has to be probated first. And once the will is probated, then the testamentary trust, the trust within the will will come into effect. So a living trust, you sign it now, it's good now. A testamentary trust, it's a trust within the will. It's only come, it will come into effect in the future after death and after the will is probated. Now, with regard to living trusts, we do have revocable and we have irrevocable trusts that are signed now while you're living. Revocable trust, is where you create this trust and it could be re revoked and amended at any time. <clears throat> and the IRS and Medicaid, look at the assets held in a revocable trust is yours because you could take it anytime you want. You could take the income, you could take the assets, you could change it, you could amend it, modify it, revoke it, you do whatever you want. It's the revocable trust. The irrevocable trust is a trust that you can't revoke without going through a certain procedure. The way we draft almost all of our irrevocable trusts, we make them because our clients want this quite easy to revoke. I know it sounds like a contradiction in terms, but yes, you can revoke your irrevocable trust pursuant to the terms, if anybody wants to know, 7-1.9 of the estate's powers and trust law. Let's look at the next bullet point. How do you get money into a trust? If it's this entity, how do you get assets into this entity? The answer is you transfer the asset into the trust. So let's say you have a, a home and you want the home to go into the trust, whether it's revocable or irrevocable, you need a deed to change the title to the trustee of the trust. And it's as simple as that. What if it's a bank account? Change the title on the bank account to the trustee of the trust. What if it's a brokerage account? You get the picture. Change the title to the trustee uh, of the trust. So it'll be John Jones, as trustee of the Jones Family Trust dated April 14, 2022. But what about jewelry or personal property or your furniture or an expensive painting? How do you get that into the trust? 
Well, we'll do an assignment of that asset into the trust. And the law says with as much specificity as we can. So when we do that assignment, we have to make sure that there's absolutely no question that what we're assigning into the trust is a, 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 an asset that is described with such specificity, there's no question that we know what that property is. You know, everyone would say, oh, that's it. There's no question. And when is this trust terminated? Well, by its terms, it could terminate at any time. You could say, oh, you know, this terminates when I die and then I want my assets to, to be distributed equally amongst my children. Or you could say, uh, within 10 years, I want it revoked. Or it could be revoked upon certain contingencies like death uh, or the death of someone else or upon the beneficiaries reaching a certain age, that's a contingency, et cetera. So who are the parties to a trust? We have the creator of the trust called the grantor, the settlor, or the creator. So that's you or me. We're the ones that create the trust. Who manages the assets in that trust? That's the trustee, or it could be trustees. Now, if I'm the creator, can I be the trustee as well? Yes, but sometimes it's not good practice depending on the type of trust we draft. There is not one trust that we have drafted that was the same as another trust that we've drafted. And we do at least one every single day of the week. We've done thousands in our firm uh, and everyone is a little different. Everyone's family structure is different. Everyone's situation is different. Uh, should the attorney draft the trust? Absolutely. Yesterday we dealt, well, what's today, Thursday? On Tuesday, we dealt with uh, a family. They had their uh, business attorney draft the Medicaid trust and we're having huge problems with it. Uh, and uh, we're stuck, unfortunately. There's just a little provision that this attorney did not put in. And uh, you know the family should have used an elder law attorney such as my firm, uh, but make sure that you don't do it yourself. Make sure that your general practitioner doesn't do the trust uh, himself or herself. You need a dedicated attorney that does this type of work. And I'm not just saying this because that's what I do. I see it week in and week out like we saw on Tuesday. Uh, okay, next slide. Well, when should you do a will? And when should you do a trust? Well, this is pretty much a quick, uh, uh, sorry, a trick question because almost everyone should have a will. And if you have assets, you should have a trust. Not always, but most of the time. A will gets probated, which means that the will goes to the court and the court says that uh, the will is a valid document. It was signed right. There was no undue influence etc. no fraud that they could see, and we'll say that this will is good. So the will gets probated. The trust avoids probate. So you bypass that. A will is not private. It's public. So if you want things private, you do the trust. A trust expedites things. A trust avoids a will contest. With a trust, you could have continuity of management of those assets even if you become incapacitated. And again, that list goes on and on because there's so many other reasons to do a trust depending on the circumstances. So, excuse me, documents that we do interface with the trust. For example, the last will and testament, if we do a trust, maybe we want to do a pour over will where if an asset is not in the trust, the asset will pour over into the trust. That's called a pour over will. What about a power of attorney? The power of attorney should coordinate with the trust. 
gets a little complicated, doesn't it? But in that power of attorney, you want the power to create a trust. And let's say you did that power 30 years ago and the trust needs a little tweaking. You wanna modify that trust. You want the ability, maybe that trust is outdated. You may wanna revoke the trust. You can't do any of this without special provisions uh, in the power of attorney to let the agent do that. The power of appointment, which is what we needed last Tuesday for a client. Uh, well, you need the right to exercise that in the power, uh, power of attorney. If you don't have that, like these clients on Tuesday, you could be stuck. And if you don't have the right to make gifts or transfer assets into a trust, et cetera, you can't do Medicaid planning later on or estate planning. So you do want these documents to all be coordinated. Uh, by the way, I'm gonna go for about another five, 10 minutes, and then I'll take questions. Now, we have revocable and we have irrevocable trust. I went into the basics on that. Uh, you have these revocable and irrevocable for, for different reasons. You also have simple versus complex trusts. A simple uh, trust is a trust where all of the income goes to the beneficiaries. But with a simple trust, you don't distribute the principal. And with a simple trust, there's a $300, uh, sorry, $300 uh, tax exemption. With a complex trust, uh, it distributes some, but not all of the income to the beneficiaries. And it can distribute uh, principal to the beneficiaries. And with a complex trust, you could make charitable uh, uh, contributions as you know, from that complex trust, but there's only a hundred dollar tax exemption. So the living trust is also called an inter vivos trust, Latin, during your lifetime, inter during vivos lifetime. So that's a living trust. So we also call it an inter vivos trust versus the testamentary trust, the trust within your will. These slides are available for you guys if you want it later on. Now, many type of uh, uh, estate tax planning mechanisms use the concept of a grantor trust. If you're one of those people that like to look things up, look at the IRS code, section 671 to 678, and these are the grantor trust rules. Sometimes a client would want to give assets away and transfer them into the trust, but they're the ones that may wanna get the income and they're the ones that may wanna pay the income taxes on it. So the grantor trust, uh, there's so many permutations, but a client might say, yeah, I wanna make these gifts, but I also wanna lower my taxable estate and I don't want the income. Give it to my kids or give it to third parties but I, even though I'm not getting the income, I want to be taxed on the income. So the individual will decide, you know, because that'll lower the estate. So a lot of techniques. Some of these techniques were uh, going to uh, go by the wayside uh, in the Build Back Better plan that President Biden proposed, but that never passed. So this goes about grantor trust status. Uh, the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. Boy, this is one of the biggest type of estate planning techniques that we use. And you might say, you know, this is all well and good. I wanna do it simply. I'm just gonna just go to my real estate attorney and transfer the home uh, and my other assets to my kids directly. Boy, could that cost you and your family a lot of money. So because you don't have the tax advantages anymore. You don't get the basis step up. You don't get the capital gains tax exclusion on the home. The list goes on and on. What if the, one of the child that you wanna to give to gets divorced? What if that child has a creditor? Um, and that's aside from all the money you're gonna lose uh, because you just gifted the money outright or the home outright to the children. But for that Medicaid trust, the trust has to be irrevocable, not revocable. Don't forget, though, 
you can revoke the irrevocable trust. The trust has to be drafted a certain way, so I don't have to get into some of those bullet points. There are times when we may not want to use that Medicaid trust, and that's typically if we have an exempt transfer for Medicaid purposes. And I just listed here on slide 30. Uh, but when you transfer a home into this trust, you get to live there. If you rent it out, you get the rental income. Uh, you could have the trustees, it could be a child. You could even change the trustee if you want. Uh, the, the trustee or a child sell the property and you, you downsize or upsize or whatever you want. You get your capital gains tax exclusion of 250,000 or a husband and wife 500,000, you get a basis step up. If you paid 50,000 for the home and now it's worth uh, 750,000, no capital gains at all on that $700,000 gain. None, which would be a few hundred thousand right there. You could maintain control with the limited power of appointment. You could say, I want the assets to go differently. I don't want to split it equally amongst my three children, only to two of the children, not my son, because he won the lottery. And we actually had a case like that a few years ago, where one daughter won the lottery, mom changed her will. You know, and the will said, I love you more than anything, but I'm going to provide for my other daughter because you want all this money in the lottery. Uh, you could transfer brokerage accounts to a trust. You could transfer bank accounts to the trust. Uh, now, this is a slide that goes over the pros uh, of the uh, trust and uh, really the negatives to transferring assets without the uh, uh, trust. For example, if you, you know, that home that might be worth 750,000 now, uh, if you just transfer to the kids, the kids get a carryover basis, you know, and if it, the basis is 50,000, you know, let's say the home goes up to a million dollars, you're losing, you have to pay, they're gonna have to pay capital gains on a million dollars of gain when we could have just eliminated that with the trust and do Medicaid planning as well. I wanted to now get this slide here in as well, because you see, estate planning is not all about estate taxes. Almost all of us don't have this amount of assets. Some of us do, most people don't. And estate planning does all these other things. So estate planning uh, will comprise of minors trust. You don't want your uh, children or grandchildren to get at age 18. So you do a trust. Maybe they get a third at uh, 21, a third at 25, and a third at 30, or everything at 30, or whatever you want. But that's a minors trust. Special needs trust if the assets are going to go to a disabled individual. So they could stay on Medi Medicaid, they could stay on SSI, and still the assets are there as a war chest for that child or another individual with special needs. What about a spendthrift trust? And we this, do this all the time. Let's say there's a child that you don't want to give outright to because that child's not good with money. They just can't hold on to money. So we could do a spendthrift trust and put that trust in the will or put it into our Medicaid trust or have a standalone spendthrift trust for that child or third party. We can do this, We've, we just did this, actually I did this with the clients I spoke to this morning, an irrevocable life insurance trust to get all of the life insurance out of your taxable estate. With these clients this morning, they had this huge life insurance policy, it's out of their taxable estate, and we saved the family just on that. Now I'd say almost $3 million. Uh, you know, and the trust was only a few thousand dollars. So I think they got their money's worth. Uh, you, just so you know, you can actually name in the trust a trust protector or protectors. 
that will look over the work of the trustee. Let's say you have a child that you trust implicitly, but maybe they're not great with money and you want a professional to look over what they're doing. You could name a trust protector. And here's some of these provisions. We put in this disclaimer, just so you know, everybody's situation is different. We can't give you any legal advice because we don't know your situation. But we hope that you could learn something from this going forward. So I'm going to stop now and I'm more than happy. Here's uh, contact information for me, for you, if anyone wants it. So he, this is my contact information. Uh, and uh, Shana, I'm here to answer any questions that anyone may have. Um, that's one question. Sure. Um, what is the advantage of, of a living trust? The advantage? Uh, well, depends on the type of trust. We do trust for estate planning to get the assets out for estate planning purpose to eliminate or reduce estate and gift taxes. That's number one. We get assets out for Medicaid to protect all the assets while still getting the tax advantages that I just spoke about. Um, we do trust for disabled people so that they can have the, the assets as a war chest, but still get all their benefits like Medicaid and SSI. So the list, you know, just what I was talking about, there are many, many different advantages of the living trust. Yes, yes. Um, another question, if your executor dies along with you, who will manage the will? In almost every single will that we have, we name another executor in case the executor dies. So let's take the question one step further. Let's say the executor and the successor executor dies as well. Then the court would appoint a, uh, an executor. That can be any family member or? Oh, of course. Okay. Usually it's a family member. Okay. 